Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we're continuing in the study of the book of Acts. Uh, we've done 10, 11, or 12 episodes so far. We're, um, we're today in chapter 9, beginning with verse 25. So if you haven't seen the previous studies, I highly recommend you go back and watch it all from the beginning. But uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last time. And before we get started, though, uh, let me ask uh, Brother Ted and Brother Joe to say hi. And um, you guys decide between yourselves who wants to speak first today. I'll go ahead and go first and get it out of the way. Uh, hi, everybody. This is Ted from Texas. And my channel is called God's Truth Ministries. And uh, there's just a few videos on there about uh, the gospel of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, the one we try to lift up here every day uh, in these studies. And I've uh, got some uh, other, uh, not just evangelistic videos, but videos on there for uh, edifying the saints to uh, find their way through this world. And I uh, hope you guys stick with us. This is really getting fun here in the Book of Acts, so stick around. Thanks, brother. Yeah, it is fun. I'm having a great time in this study. Brother Joe? Yeah, this is uh, Joe from the Sebastian Dresden channel, and uh, it's a channel for fellowship and learning. And this is a, a good study, a real good study. Uh, it's something that I was thinking about earlier today. It's just not done very much anymore. Uh, there used to be the brothers would get together and, and do a Bible study, just, just get together to study the Word. And uh, I noticed on uh, YouTube especially, uh, so many of us don't have a church home. And, uh, and those of us that do, uh, Bible study seems to be something lost to the, to the past uh, a lot. And so uh, we may not get as many views as controversial Mandela videos or uh, videos about last day's prophecies and so many things. But I'm really enjoying just a good old-fashioned Bible study. And... Uh, and uh, regardless of, of how many people find it interesting anymore, uh, it's of great interest uh, to me. So I'm really enjoying this. Back to you. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it, this is really the, exactly the same thing that I did for seven years in my home with people coming over for a Bible study, and it gradually turned into a, a actually a church service. We we had. Uh, we had music and worship. Uh, we had uh, fellowship, prayer time, um, uh, and of course the teaching and, and study together. And it's, it's the same thing. The only difference is uh, you guys are not sitting in my uh, living room with me, <laughs> but it, it's almost the same thing anyway. The only difference is I can't give you guys a hug. It was very co common for us to all hug each other, you know, when we were here in, in person. <laughs> So someday I'll get together with you guys and we'll get those uh, caught up on caught up on those hugs. Uh, I, I noticed that um, Brother Stephen from England is planning on doing a, a, a study on uh, about a is there a need for a, like a local church or I can't remember exactly right. <clears throat> and uh, I, I think that this is an example of where, where a lot of people have um, gone in the church in terms of. Uh, their desire to have fellowship and study and be taught and learn together and like we're doing, but it, rather than going down to the, to the corner church, um, they're, they're so much discontent with what's happening in the local churches in America. I think the same thing is true in Europe, uh, that that discontent has led people to find some other alternatives. And this is an alternative that uh, I'm real happy to have it. All right, so let's pick up uh, where we left off, chapter 9, verse 25. The only thing I'm going to say to give everybody con uh, context, the basic context, and I, again, I urge you to go back and go ahead and watch this today if you're watching it live, but uh, if, uh, um, if you uh, uh, really want to get the most out of the study, you go back and watch from Acts chapter 1, verse 1, and watch it in, in continuity. Uh, but... The book of Acts is really uh, written by the uh, by Luke, and he is a, a, considered to be a great historian in hindsight now, 
and he wrote basically a 30-year history of the church. From he wrote it about uh, the 60 A.D. So it covers approximately the first 30 years of church history, and we covered a lot of ground. But now we're at the point where um, uh, Saul of Tarsus was persecuting the church. Um, he was going to Damascus to find believers there and persecute them. But Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Paul was converted. He's a believer. And now he's, he's preaching. And the, the people that he uh, used to be allies with, the Sanhedrin, those people now, um, they realize that he's, he's uh, on the other side. So now they're out to, to get him. Um, and it says that they're, in verse 24, uh, it says that, um, but they're laying a weight. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, but they're, they're laying a weight was known of Saul. This Saul is his name, Saul of Tarsus. Uh, he's going to begin to be called Paul at some point. Uh, that's his Roman name. But their laying a weight was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. So Saul was aware that they wanted to kill him. And, you know, he he had work to do, ministry, uh, and uh, a lot of preaching to do, and he, he certainly didn't um, want to be killed, and, and so he was doing everything he could to prevent it. So uh, verse 25 says, Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. That's a... You know, I've seen this portrayed in, in movies, and it's real interesting how they uh, go in the dark of night and try to sneak him out of the city, lowering a basket over the wall. And uh, In verse 26, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, and believed not that he was a disciple. Okay, that's verses uh, 25 and 26. All right, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I forget who went last, uh, first last time, uh, but uh, I'll go ahead and, and uh, go first. Uh, listen, I, you know, I, I can't really blame the, the, the local church in Jerusalem. They're terrified of this guy. Uh, he was uh, uh, public enemy number one, and, uh, and now he's uh, miraculously joined their side. I'm thinking double agent. You know, like you hear about Trump all the time. Yeah, he's a plant from Hillary. You know, uh, they could have been thinking the same thing. You know, he's he's pretending to have converted so he can gather names and addresses and and uh, have us all taken at night. You know, and so uh, uh, he knows that they're after him. They know they're after him. But the Church of Jerusalem may think this is all a big ruse, and so uh, he's got those with him that that uh, believe him. But evidently, the majority still think. Double agent, maybe. Yeah. All right, uh, brother Ted. Yeah, the word that that comes to my mind is you know infiltrator. You know, just uh, I mean, uh, you know, he's coming from Damascus, and then he comes to Jerusalem. You know, kind of uh, the Christian headquarters, and uh, you know, I, I can just see them just. Afraid and not really believing. I mean, they, they they would think probably this guy's here to see how many people come to our Bible study, you know, or so to speak, you know, our fellowship. And then uh, he's going to go back and just report uh, to the Sanhedrin everybody's name, you know, that he that he sees here, just just making a list and checking it twice. And uh, we're all going to be on the death list. I'm sure that's that's what they're thinking. It's hard to believe that the guy who was the ultimate enemy of you is now a believer. In your Christ, so uh, let's look at what's ahead. Well, it it was only a few verses back where um, uh, Ananias uh, he was explaining to God that about Saul, in, in case God wasn't aware of it, I guess <laughs> who this Saul was, and he was very much afraid to go to. Saul as God was directing him and uh, so it, it, it seems to be the initial reaction of everybody to be afraid of this man and, and with good reason you know he was rounding them up and it says they were being slaughtered so um, 
probably, you know, this this discretion on their part was a wise thing. Uh, I'll read more. Um, Uh, it says, and they believed not that he was a disciple. Verse 27, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. Uh, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. Well, verse 31 is kind of out of context with the others, but uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, a friend in need is a friend indeed, and uh, Barnabas uh, was there for, for uh, Paul, and I, I believe that friendship uh, extends through a good, good portion of uh, the New Testament. Uh, without Barnabas's uh, personal testimony, you know, this guy's with me, he's okay, uh, I'm a witness to the fact that he's a true believer, uh, Paul would have been uh, on his own and uh, out there uh, uh, ministering Christ with, with uh, no support, no no uh, fellowship, uh, no place to turn for times of trouble. So, uh, you know, it, it, it just shows how good it is to have brothers uh, when you need them. Thank you. All right, Brother Ted. Yeah, it, it, apparently from from the the context there, it looks like uh, uh, they went to some disciples first, uh, verse twenty six, and then to the apostles, uh, the big wigs, you know, we'd say uh, in verse twenty seven. Although they didn't think of themselves that way, but uh, just to the followers, uh, it looks like Barnabas took Saul to them first. They were afraid of him. But when he took him to the uh, the apostles, he uh, it's it's almost like uh, Barnabas didn't leave uh, Saul there to defend himself, you know, kind of like Joe was saying there, and he put it very well that uh, it, it was Barnabas was a very needed friend at that time to uh, kind of be an intercessor and almost a lawyer to defend and make the case uh, that Saul was truly truly. A follower of Christ now, um, and it, it seems to me there that not only was he a, a, a believer, you know, but but Barnabas makes the case this: listen, this guy stuck his neck out there and preached boldly in the synagogues the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, this guy really, literally put his neck and his life on the line, uh, and we we saw the consequences of what happened there at Damascus. Uh, He's, there, there's no there's no bones about it. This guy's truly a follower because of what he said publicly about the Lord Jesus Christ. He preached him boldly. And uh, as we said before, this seems like it's going to be the pattern, doesn't it, guys, for the, for the rest of, of Paul's life, uh, putting his life on the line uh, to preach Christ. Uh, back to you. Yeah, Barnabas... Uh... When, we, when he was first introduced uh, a few chapters back, uh, it, it was really interesting. I, I, it didn't really register with me in the past, uh, the, the information about him. I think his name originally was it was something else. Maybe it was Justice, something else. And then Barnabas actually was what they called him. As a, it was really, I guess, a nickname. It means son of encouragement. I think that uh, it may be in other words, um, Son of something, but it's it's a very it's a it's a nickname they gave him, basically praising him and his character and his his uh, his attitude. Um, but he he I guess he was wealthy. He sold everything and brought it to the apostles as they were doing at that time, and and uh, and now he's you know he's continued being real real busy uh, doing what he can for the church and 
and so he's he becomes a very uh, very integral part of uh, Paul's ministry from this point. Now I'm going to read this portion in the Amplified just to see if it is helpful at all. It says when, verse 26, he says, when he arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. However, Barnabas uh, took him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road to Damascus and how he had spoken to him and how at Damascus Saul had preached openly and spoken confidently in the name of Jesus. So he was with them, moving around freely as one among them in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. Uh, he was talking and arguing with the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews, but they were attempting to kill him. Um, when their brothers found out about the plot, they brought him down to Caesarea uh, and sent him off to Tarsus, his hometown. Um, well, that helps. That's a little bit helpful, just more in, a, in our common language there. But uh, uh, well, there's a footnote here for Barnabas. Let me look down what it says there. E. Okay, yeah, it, it just says his name means son of encouragement. Uh, all right, I guess nothing else needs to be said about that. Let me read further in the KJV. Um, uh, verse 31, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, uh, which, he, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick with the palsy. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, just to uh, uh, touch on Barnabas uh, again, uh, he is all throughout Scripture uh, spoken of repeatedly uh, as being uh, uh, with Paul, and I, I don't see Barnabas uh, doing anything too much except being Paul's companion. And then I think they had a split up at some point, but uh, an encourager, and, and I think that was a, a gift that uh, we don't discuss much uh, in the church. That is extremely important. And that is just uh, doing what Barnabas did, did is setting an example for, I think, a gift of the Spirit, which is the encouragement of the saints. And, you know, I think of a couple of people on here on YouTube, uh, Barbara Long comes to mind, a couple other people who never make videos, but their comments uh, are so encouraging uh, to people all the time. Uh, they don't have negative things to say about anybody, but when they find us, a place or a person that they can give encouragement to, they do. And uh, it's just a joy, even though you don't speak with them much, their presence is felt uh, heavily by me anyway. And so, uh, and then I noticed uh, uh, Paul heads for Tarsus. This is his uh, hometown. Uh, this is where he, everyone talks of Paul for Paul of Tarsus. Well, this is the, the biggest center. And I, I remember this from someone's teaching years ago again. Uh, Tarsus is the, it's bigger than Alexandria, it's bigger than uh, Greece, it's bigger than anywhere for philosophical discussion and, and a, like a center of education and thought. And this is the home of the Hellenistic Jews, who uh, uh, that would be the Sadducees for the most part, who don't believe in the resurrection, they don't believe in angels, they don't, they, they believe that when we die our spirit goes to be with God, but not in any physicality at all. And so uh, Paul, being brought up under, I forget the guy's name, starts with a G, uh, but uh, was converted from uh, uh, Sadducee to Pharisee, which is no love lost, like I said yesterday, between these two groups. And so uh, uh, Paul is, is going home, and uh, I think he's there for a while, uh, kind of a time of rest, but I, I'm, not, I'm not certain about that. And those are just my thoughts. Back to you. All right, thanks, Brother Chad. 
Well, thanks, Joe. That's that's some good stuff, and and I think it's it's really important when we see the things Joe's talking about, the things uh, within history, and uh, sometimes these uh, locations of different cities and their and their mindsets and different cultures and different. Uh, and different uh, attitudes that people carry around, you know, different cultures and, and even different regions have different attitudes, mindsets beyond just their 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 customs and quirks, what have you. And so that's all good to know. And I think Paul, uh, knowing uh, regional uh, manners, uh, I started saying mannerisms, but more more customs and uh, their little uh, cliques and ways. It really, uh, God really used him uh, as a learned man to, uh, to, as it says there in verse 29, uh, and this opens up a whole other subject, is uh, he spoke, babe, uh, I'm getting my <laughs> words mixed up here, he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. And boy, I really think that uh, we have a problem here in America, uh, the balance between uh, boldness and and charity and uh, you know I, I've heard it said many times but you could word it different ways you know there's a balance between speaking the truth and love you know and uh, and just speaking either too much truth where it's cold dead liturgical church services or it's all love where there's no speaking boldly and affirming the things that God truly cares about where God truly stands on on, on things especially on the person of Christ and uh, that just really uh, grabbed me right off. I couldn't get much past verse uh, 29, brother. Um, but I, I do like that, that they, uh, by the time the churches uh, found out about Saul's conversion, obviously, and, and no more was he persecuting the, uh, the believers all through there. It says, through all, all that region, Judea, verse 31, and Galilee and Samaria, they were all edified and walking in the fear of the Lord. <laughs> And in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, they were multiplied. So they weren't afraid of man, because I think it's Proverbs 27 that says, uh, the fear of man bringeth a snare. So they weren't just afraid of this human being, but they were walking in the fear or, or you know, the reverence of God, where their attention needed to be. And so um, you have a lot in those verses, brother, but those are the things that jumped out at me. So uh, back to you, brother. Hmm. Well... I really I liked your thoughts on the balancing truth and love. Um, that that's that's something probably that uh, one of us ought to do a video on that subject. You know, I, there's a, my my wife had a, a friend for most of her life that she no longer talks to anymore, and it's it's basically because this person's attitude was um, she had no filter. She would just say completely anything. Uh, to somebody uh, without considering their feelings, and her and and her excuse was always, "I'm just being honest." Well, sometimes we shouldn't be so honest, you know, if it's going to hurt people's feelings, you know. And there's a, there's a question about how to how much truth will, do we want to share, and considering, you know, uh, that we want to be loving and and not hurt people. Um, so that's a really interesting. Uh, the let me look at the text again because there were a lot of things I was going to say but I'll just go through it. It said um, um, okay it, then the had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified. The church having to rest at this point is uh, it's really, really interesting because we know that there was, there was, uh, they were arresting John and Peter and the other apostles. And initially, right after Pentecost, there was a series of arrests, a series of sermons by Peter, and then the Sanhedrin would bring them in, arrest them, hold them, and threaten them, and even sometimes beat them. But uh, uh, there was no death, there was no uh, murders or, or executions until Stephen. Now, I've been looking, I told you guys about these charts on timelines. Uh, I, I gave you the links to those. I, I spent quite a bit of time last few days looking at like probably a hundred of those. It's really been interesting. I've got a, maybe three that I think that are uh, 
the best for this particular study. And uh, it seems to be pretty consistent that there's a roughly a three-year period between uh, Pentecost and Stephen's death. So you had about three years where, okay, the authorities, the Sanhedrin, they were not happy about this preaching of Jesus. Uh, they did some things to impede it, uh, but Stephen, it took basically three, three and a half years before they finally reached the point where they were ready to kill someone over it. And then it said, after Stephen, then I forget how it's phrased, but basically all hell broke loose. And this is when Saul was uh, designated as the one to find them all, round them up, imprison them, uh, and even, it said, slaughter them. So you had this period of time where it was kind of um, mild and it was relatively safe, and then it got to be really, really bad. And now I'm surprised right now to see this stated that um, the churches had then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and were edified. So they're having a period where they're feeling more comfortable. They're all able to go out and preach in Jerusalem, and they're not going to be very much afraid. And it says, and walking in the fear of the Lord and then the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. So there's a period of time where they're preaching, they're not so much afraid, and the church is growing. And it came to pass as Peter passed through at all the quarters he came, also the saints that dwelt at Lydia, Lydda. Okay, uh, uh, I, I don't need to talk anymore about that. I will want to do want to say one thing about this Barnabas uh, and the idea of being an encourager. Um, I've been on YouTube for over eight years now, and I, I've had dealt with, I don't know, uh, a lot of people that that uh, have watched my videos uh, and that I, I'm not even aware of it until they make a comment that's very encouraging. Maybe that they, they sense in the video that I need encouragement <laughs> because, <laughs> because I've had a lot of periods where it just seems like... It just seems like, can't we just get along? Does everybody have to be fighting about everything all the time? And I'm getting a little bit disturbed by it. And someone sends me a beautiful comment. And they and I've never heard from them before. And they even say, I've never commented before, but I've watched your videos for years. And it's just, that's, that's just like invigorating to me. It's just making me feel, okay, we're not wasting our time. Some people are listening. Some people are benefiting. And this, the encouragers is a special ministry that I greatly value, and uh, obviously everybody should be an encourager because some people are more gifted at that, and this Barnabas is so gifted at it, they give him the name Son of Encouragement. Uh, I guess, look, before I go on, if anybody wants to say more on this. Look, I had one more thing to say on that, on that passage, and I think, first of all, let me just say, I think everybody needs, uh, everybody needs a, a Barnabas, right? But uh, I think uh, the thing that, that jumps out at me is it's in verse 31, brother, where it says they had uh, rest or peace throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. Well, what, what surprises me, as zealous as the, uh, as uh, what did uh, Joe call him the other day, the den of snakes, uh, you know, uh, the brood of vipers, as, as zealous as they were to, to kill Christ and to uh, persecute uh John and Peter earlier, uh, you know, and Stone Stephen. I don't understand why they didn't take up the ball, uh, take the baton. Where, you know, when when Saul got converted, why didn't some of these other guys jump in and and say, okay, well, he's not on our side anymore. We got to do the persecution. Why? I don't understand why why there was peace really because these guys were nuts. They they were complete nut jobs. You know, satanic scumbuckets. I call them that uh, it seems like they would have just picked right up and, and started persecuting the saints again. Any, any comments on that? Yeah, uh, I, I heard a teaching on this. And again, this is from years ago, so forgive me if I get this wrong. But right around the time that Stephen was killed, there was a change of the Caesars. And this is uh, the era of Caligula. And Caligula came to power right about that time. Now, you'll notice when they killed Christ, they had to take him before Pontius Pilate. The Jewish nation uh, did not have authority, I don't think, to uh, capital punishment. For capital punishment, they were required to uh, go before Pontius Pilate or whoever the 
uh, governor was over their area, and they were very afraid because Caligula was widely known to be insane, and uh, and to, to cross him or to do anything that he may consider uh, uh, not respectful towards his office was uh, in the forefront of their minds. So uh, not only was Caligula at that time trying to get his statue put into the Jewish temple because they were one of the holdouts who wouldn't put his statue in their temple, uh, they were keenly aware that showing any disrespect or bringing someone before the local governor could get back to him they were real, just real tedious about let's let's not anger the Romans uh, at this point, and so I think they were trying to keep things on the down low, uh, like hiding out to kill Paul at night, not during the day, taking him when he's preaching, and so uh, that that was a teaching I remember. So that's all I have on that. Hmm. Hmm. Um, well, I guess before we go on, you, just, you made me remember something you said earlier about. Saul and Tarsus. Um, I wasn't aware of that. I mean, I, I've never heard anything. I'm not questioning at all. I'm, I'm, but I just wasn't aware that uh, he was a Sadducee and be, that later became a Pharisee. But uh, the name you're looking for was Gamaliel. Yeah, so it seems that he was, Paul was highly educated in, in uh, growing up in Tarsus and then he when he came to Jerusalem, he studied under Gamaliel, who was the most respected, admired Jewish theologian of the time, and he said he's like he was at his side, like you know, he was one of his main primary students and proteges of Gamaliel. So, um, uh, I guess well, that's all I wanted to say about that. Let me read a little more then. Uh, Uh, verse 32, and it came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda, and there found a certain man named Anus, uh, it's spelled A-E-N-E-A-S, so if you have a better pronunciation, uh, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy, and Peter said unto him, Anus, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole, arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. All right, your thoughts on that? Uh, my first, my first thought is what a crappy name to have. Uh, <laughs> my, my, my uh, second thought is 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 how uh, how these healings have spurred growth in the uh, first century church and uh, uh, I think it's pretty amazing that uh, you know the healing of Peter at the at the temple when 5,000 uh, were gathered around and became uh, followers of Christ and uh, again uh, uh, just the numerous times that a healing was the uh, fire that that uh, lit conversion so uh, powerful stuff there I guess uh, no real thoughts other than that yeah okay brother Ted yeah once once again I think uh, the miraculous power of the of the apostles is just on display once again with Aeneas here and when it says it kept his bed eight years I guess that means he was he was so sick being bedridden you know and just I mean, just think about the hopelessness that this guy felt. I mean, sometimes I think we just have to put ourselves in the position of uh, of the of the people that you know these these people that we read about that ha you know that were that were in history and the things that happened. Sometimes I wonder what what was in their heart, what was in their mind, what did what did they feel like, what was their day to day existence, and this must have just been something that's terrible. And when Peter says to him in verse thirty four. Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. <laughs> Arise and get busy. Arise and get to work. I mean, what a, what a thing to do. I mean, I remember another place in one of the Gospels where uh, Jesus healed someone, and then they, uh, I think they got up and started serving, uh, you know, started serving the house like, like a butler or, or maid or something. I mean, he arose immediately, it says. And I like how Peter always, 
didn't we have back in chapter five? Uh, you know, uh, wasn't it where P Peter told the the, the lame man, uh, "Silver and gold have I not, but such as I have I give unto thee." In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And uh, the fact that that Peter and and these disciples, it's always on the name of, and we could get into this uh, sometime if you guys want. When they talk about in the name of Jesus Christ, and like we pray prayers, in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, I think it means on behalf of him, on behalf of his authority and his power, uh, uh, because, of his, because of his authority, because of his power. I know the old, you know, the old uh, cops and robbers movies, uh, you know, stop in the name of the law, you, know, you don't hear that anymore. But uh, I think it just means on behalf of the authority of Christ, the Lord of Lords, rise up and walk. So this is this is some good stuff there, brother. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the uh, thing that I find interesting about this individual and in the healing is that there's no indication he's seeking out Peter or want to be healed, as, as some some people would come to Jesus or come to the apostles. Uh, you know, they wanted Peter's shadow just to fall on them, or they would come and touch the cloth of Jesus as he walked by, and they're they're seeking out healing. Now, this person, uh, there's no indication of that at all. It's just that Peter just, as, as uh, I'm sure he's led by, by the Holy Spirit, and God's just telling him, go heal that guy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that would be a nice surprise, wouldn't it? You're not even you're not even asking for healing or thinking about healing, and someone comes up and just out of the blue says, you're healed. <laughs> Uh, but and he rose immediately. See, this is another thing. We talk about the difference between um, present time and back then. And uh, a lot of the people that are trying to take credit for healings, uh, the thing, the, especially the people that we we all object to, like the Benny Hins and and the like, uh, they're. Uh, their healings, if if they're happening at all, are are not as not dramatic and, and so obvious. I mean, um, the, these things are uh, it's just a, suddenly there's a healing. The only time I can think of where there was a a delay to the healing was when Jesus healed the blind man, and he first he saw like people like trees, and then and then he. Uh, some, then I forgot what else Jesus did, but then something else he did, and, and then he saw it perfectly. But uh, these things are instantaneous, and they're clear-cut, miraculous healings that no one can question or argue whether this was legitimate or not. And again, the purpose of the healings is not just to be kind to people. These are the signs that, that, that Jesus and then the early church used to show that this is the work of God, and that, that that was the proof to offer the people that look. This is the proof, so that you can trust us, you can have confidence that that this is of God, and that this is the truth. Um, anything else before I, I go on? Yeah, I just want to focus uh, like a laser beam on what Ted said. That you know, he he. Any time that the apostles heal someone, it seems so far. That they, that they make a point of saying, this is not us, this is on behalf of Jesus Christ. And uh, naming his name, laying the miracle at his feet. And uh, again, you know, I, the first thing I said when we started this book, if there's one thing I remember about the book of Acts, it's called the Acts of the Apostles. It really should be called the Acts of Christ uh, or the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and they they uh, are very careful to uh, remind people of that each and every time that someone is healed. So uh, again, you know, I, I don't know that uh, today's faith healers uh, uh, spend so much time uh, doing that if there is, is genuine healing, and uh, certainly not uh, to the point where it would affect book sales. Back to you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any more thoughts, Brother Ted? Okay. All right, let me read further. Um, verse 36. 
Now, there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, uh, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. Uh, this woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for as much as uh, Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. Uh, when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. Your thoughts on that? Uh, my first thoughts are uh, how similar this is to the time uh, Christ healed that little girl. Uh, I forget her name, but it was a, a daughter of somebody. And uh, he asked everybody to leave the room. And uh, and, he, and he said the same thing, didn't he? Didn't Jesus say, arise? I mean, it's almost the same, I think. It's almost like Peter was uh, repeating exactly what Christ did with the, with that daughter of somebody, that, with that kid. I don't know, it's just what came to mind. Yeah, I don't remember the daughter's name being mentioned. Uh, it's probably just described as the person's daughter. But, uh, yeah, it's very similar. Um, Brother Ted? Well, this is just, this is an amazing, amazing thing. And, uh, you know, this is obviously a woman who was loved and really left a legacy of, of it talks about in verse 36, good works and alms deeds. Uh, I think uh, my, my new King James said something like ch charitable deeds, loving things that this woman had done. Uh, she was sick. She died. Uh, they prepared her for burial later in her upper chamber. And uh, the, the thing that, that, that stu stood out to me was uh, these people are weeping, remembering what she was like in verse 39. They brought him to the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping, and showing the coats and garments uh, which Dorcas made. I mean, the, there's these women saying, "Look, this is what this is what uh, Dorcas was like. She she's someone who sewed all these things, made these things. She was she was creative. She had such a a great side to her. And uh, if they're heartbroken, but look what Peter does. And like Joe said, just like in the Gospels, he put everybody out. <laughs> and I don't know if it was for focus' sake or just probably just to uh, Pray to the Lord uh, and very con concentrating, you know, and just um, said to her, arise. It's very much like what Christ did in the Gospels. And it, 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 I mean, uh, it seems to me just like he's following in the steps of the Lord in the way he performed this miracle. It's, it's an amazing, amazing thing. We don't, we don't see this happening today, uh, at least on a regular basis. I've, I've never met anybody that we've confirmed that raised somebody from the dead. So back to you guys. Yeah, you know, I'm, I've always remembered the name Dorcas. It's just an unusual name. Uh, I, I had forgotten that her name is Tabitha. Let me see, how do they actually phrase that? Um, um, a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. Okay, so um, I don't know which, I guess Dorcas sounds like it's Greek. I don't know. I don't know how, how they get the interpretation, but she's named Tabitha, and it's interpreted as Dorcas. But the thing that gets me is that um, she was sick and then died, and then the disciples called for Peter. 
uh, when they heard that he was near, they, they, they called for him, desiring that he would not delay uh, to come to them. So, um, why would they want Peter to come if she's already died? As she died. She, they're not calling Peter to heal her. Are they calling Peter just because they, they, they want him to know about her and want her to uh, want uh, him, him to recognize that one of their beloved uh, uh, the brethren is, is, is deceased now? Uh, or, or do they do they really think that Peter could heal her and bring her back from the dead? I mean, Jesus had done it, but nobody else has done it but Jesus. Do they really think that Peter could raise someone from the dead? I, I, I think that they did. I think that they thought that Peter can bring her back to life. Uh, that's the impression that I'm getting from it. Uh, what do you guys think? I I. I... I don't think they did. I, I'm, you may be right. You know, there's no way of knowing. But I, I think we got to remember the the time. This is during first century church when there was great love between the the fellowship. There, it's not like today, where you know someone on uh, YouTube that we all know passes. We make a thirty second video. These are people who interact with each with each other. These are people that. Uh, had a great love for each other, and they, when Peter got there, they wanted to show him the coats that she had made. And uh, I just shot over to Yahoo and looked up the name, uh, meaning of the name Dorcas, and it was uh, uh, abundant with mercy. And so I think that her given name was Tabitha, and she was given this name because of her nature, uh, something that was common, I guess, back then. And so uh, I think they were just in you know, uh, memorial, uh, look at Peter, you, you know, you're one of our leaders, we want you to see this great woman who we love has passed, and she wasn't rich, she wasn't like Lydia, who was uh, uh, famous for her giving and, and hospitality through great riches, this woman that was making coats for people out of her own home, and so uh, I, I think there was a great love for this this uh, particular saint, but there's no way in know Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we'll ask for Brother Ted to be the tiebreaker on his interpretation of this. <laughs> I'm going to plead the fifth. I, th I think there's no way of knowing. It doesn't say that uh, they expected a miracle. And it doesn't say that they were unbelieving. There was there was a passage in uh, where Christ raised up one little girl, and it says uh, where Christ walked in, and he said, she's not dead, but she's sleeping. Uh, and uh, you know that's a, another subject altogether about the terminology. But uh, and it says, and they laughed him to scorn. Talking about, the, I'm talking about the account in uh, in the Gospels about Christ before he raised a girl. But there's nothing in the text that says uh, they uh, were believing for a miracle. Although some could have been, we just don't know. But uh, I think it was probably more of a memorial uh, because they stood by, you know, crying, weeping. And so there's there's just no way of knowing. It'd be good to think that they would believe for a miracle, but we just don't know. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, now, he says, and he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he called, he when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive, and it was known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. Um, uh, and it came to pass that he, that's Peter, uh, tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. Um, okay, your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I don't have many thoughts on that. Uh, uh, he dwelled many days with a tanner. I, 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 uh, I, I don't know what to think of that. There should be some significance there, though. I'll, I'll throw it to Ted. All right, Brother Ted. Well, I would just say that, uh, you know, uh, verse 42, it, it, it just, uh, there's a transition into verse 43 of a, of a you know, separate event, you know. Uh, so it's kind of like, okay, one thing's ended, another thing's starting. But, uh, you know, as you said, Brother Luke, uh, signs uh, 
produced faith. Uh, it's kind of like, I'm just thinking that at the end of John's Gospel, where he says, but these things were written that ye might believe, you know, that Jesus is the Christ. You know, uh, there was uh, there were signs in the Gospel of John uh, from Christ showing that he is the Christ, that people might believe, and that by, by believing they might have eternal life. Uh, and and because of Peter's uh, the miracle that Peter performed in raising this this woman, it became known through all of Joppa, and many believed. Many who might have been on the fence, uh, wondering about the the, the you know, the authenticity of, of uh, Christ's claims, you know, his resurrection, the miracles of Christ. I mean, this is, uh, this is not Jerusalem. This is Joppa. Uh, so uh, it looks to me like, uh, once again, this, the, the signs confirmed that the apostles were for real. And that's what the signs were for, you know, to confirm the authenticity of their message. And uh, many believed as a result. And then... Uh, Tarried many days in Joppa with Simon the Tanner. I, I, I think that's interesting. It's just, this is going to be a transition uh, for uh, the vision that Peter gets. So we'll get into that. Thanks, brother. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm wondering if just about every other person there isn't named Simon. You know, it seems like we're counting off a lot of Simons, <laughs> including Peter, who is Simon Peter. Uh, but I, 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 I conclude the same thing that uh, you just said, Brother Ted, that again we're seeing this repeated over and over and over again. A miraculous healing and many believe. Another miraculous healing and many more believe. And so we can see that these miracles followed, uh, great conver conversions were followed, and uh, that was happening over and over again. It just reinforces the, 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 uh, the principle that that period in church history, uh, these first uh, 30 years, well, actually, we're not 30 years into it yet, but uh, from Jesus' ministry on through this point in the church, we're seeing these miracles over and over again serve to uh, make people believe. And uh, so I've, I've said that it, this, the miracles serve to kind of jump start the church to get a lot of people coming on board because they they have no you can have no doubt <laughs> you know you've seen the miracles and their signs to prove that that uh, Jesus is who he claimed to be and that uh, the apostles are truly are, are representing him so um, that's the, that's the that's the result that's why you see th 3,000 people, 5,000, and more, more coming on board daily, it says. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's go to the next chapter. Um, this is chapter 10. Um, there was a certain man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian Band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Um, he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked up, uh, looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God, and now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Um, now, I'm going to ask you guys to comment on it, and if I'm not back by the time you're done commenting, then find a way to either go on or kill some time, because it's urgent. I've got to take just a little bit of a break, okay? I'll be back as soon as possible. Okay, well, I want to, as soon as Luke, uh, Luke uh, leaves the room, we'll start talking about Luke. But uh, for right now, uh, you know, uh, this is odd. The guy's a centurion and uh, uh, called the Italian band. So I guess he's uh, a centurion is a guy who's over 100 soldiers, right? And, uh, and he's employed by Rome. And it also says he's a devout man who feared God with his all his house and gave much alms to the people uh, so 
and pray to God always. Um, wow, that's kind of neat. Here we have a converted Jew, I assume, someone who's not of uh, Hebrew lineage, who's probably converted to Judaism, but not to Christianity, I'm assuming. And uh, and God appears to him and, and, uh, and doesn't say, you know, doesn't give him the gospel, but rather uh, has him summon uh, uh, Peter, who will tell him about the gospel. I assume that's what that means. And I'm just fascinated that in this day and age back then, that it's a pretty rare thing to have a centurion, a leader in the uh, Roman guard, who is devout uh, towards Judaism. And so, uh, and I'm assuming it's Judaism and not Christianity. It, it may be that he's already a Christian, but the way it says that, it almost appears to me that, that he is uh, a devout Jew in, in uh, faith, not lineage. What do, you, what do you think, Ted? Yeah, amen, brother. I, obviously, this guy, this guy is a, uh, 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 Cornelius is, is a Roman. I mean, uh, uh, over a, an Italian regiment, it says. And uh, I, 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 think, I think you're right. I, I've never thought really about the name Centurion, but obviously that means uh, someone who's a captain over 100 men. That makes sense. Cent Centurion, Century, uh, 100. So that, thanks for that, brother. Uh, but, I mean, he is someone who, you know, I've heard the expression, and I, I believe it's evident in Scripture, although... Uh, I don't know if we have an exact verse that says it. I think the theme is there is that when someone's given light, uh, they're given more light. I think you've heard that, Brother Joe. You know that, you know, when someone uh, is it responds to the light, to the revelation of God that they're given, you know, whether they're a heathen Roman or a heathen American or a heathen Africa, whatever you want to put it, uh, God gives them more light. Just like the Ethiopian we saw back in uh, chapter eight. Uh, that uh, that was trying to understand Isaiah. He was trying to understand the word. He was really wondering what Isaiah 53 meant. And God sent Philip to him. And here's a here's a Roman, here's a Roman, the, the Gentile, who's a Roman soldier. And uh, God sees that this guy wants some light. His his prayers go up to God always. He gives alms uh, to people. He's doing good deeds. He fears God with all his house. And then he sees in a vision clearly, evidently, about the ninth hour of the day, that's 3 p.m., an angel of God coming into him. So it's, it's a vision. It doesn't say the angel is physically there, but a vision of an angel. So God obviously sent this guy some more light, not just some light, but a, a, a vision of what could help fulfill uh, God's purpose in his life. And uh, I don't think we should ever underestimate God as to what he could do. I know he deals... Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But uh, he deals with people in different ways and at different times. But, I mean, look what God did for this guy. Um, because he was a guy who was truly seeking God. And he's, he's not only a, a Gentile who were seen by the Jews as someone to stay away from. But this guy was a Roman, uh, a, Roman uh, a Roman soldier, excuse me. Not just a Roman soldier, but a Roman captain, a centurion. So this is somebody, once again, you know, the least likely that, uh, you know, that you'd think the Christians would want to be around, you know, Gentile, Roman, soldier, captain. <laughs> so, wow, all these things stacked against him. But God's going to show Peter here in the vision upcoming that, no, uh, Peter, you need to go talk to this guy. Uh, I think we should, we, we're going to take note, I think we should take note in our hearts is uh, some of the people we least expect, guys, uh, are going to be people who get saved. Um, I think we just need to keep an open mind and an open heart uh, who God puts in our path. Uh, we'll see more. Um, brothers, back to you. Uh, did you you both have a chance to talk? I just was back for like the last 20 seconds. You both, okay. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get to hear what you said. I'll have to get it when I watch this back. But let me give you my thoughts on these verses here. Um, this is, to me, one of my favorite parts of the scriptures. This is a great turning point. Um, this is the great surprise. 
uh, a shocking thing, really, uh, that's going to happen here, that because the church is made up of uh, only Jews, uh, and then you have some that are Samaritans that are partly Jew. They're not full Gentile. They're, and uh, uh, so now we're going to see the Gentiles um, coming into the church. And it's, it's a shocking thing to uh, the church because they didn't expect it. They have no clue that this is supposed to happen. And the reaction is quite uh, uh, interesting. Um, but um, um, and this is also uh, historic in that it also uh, cor it should correct the uh, the teaching by the Paul onlyus that Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles and that he was uh, the first. But when I say the, I mean the one and only. Because we're going to see that Peter was he's going to preach to the Gentiles, uh, and not only is, is he to do it, but it, when we consider looking at the rest of Acts and throughout church history, we see that the apostles all went off and eventually were preaching to Gentiles. Uh, matter of fact, it becomes a transition totally away from reaching out to Jews and just accepting that the Jews are a lost cause and will preach to Gentiles. So all the apostles are apostles of the Gentiles, not just Paul. And the very first we find out is Peter. So this is a really important por portion of the scriptures regarding uh, going to his house. Well, we haven't reached that point yet. But um, uh, okay, before I before I go to read any further, any any feedback on what I just said? Uh, yeah, just two things, you know. You know, uh, uh, Luke, when I get my teeth into a bone, I, I, I have a hard time releasing it. And so all through this uh, study, I've had, uh, I went over to Yahoo and brought up meanings of names, you know. And so just to see if there's any extra light to be shed. And uh, just for the heck of it, I put in Simon the Tanner, you know. And you know what he came back with? He was despised by the Jews. Uh, he dealt with dead bodies. And so... Uh, of the Jews, he he would be considered uh, kind of like a tax collector, someone who is not to be, you know, you don't shake his hand, and you certainly don't go into his house and stay because he deals with dead bodies, and uh, and so uh, Peter chose to stay with him. And then the, the next thing that occurred to me while I was chewing on that and you were talking is that this Roman centurion, who's a captain, sent two guys to get a Jew. <laughs> I mean, here we got a, a, a Roman authority, and he's sending a couple of his soldiers, right? He's not going to be dispatching church members. He's going to be dispatching his men, soldiers, Roman soldiers, to gather up one of the apostles. Uh, that's got to be uh, a little trying. And so we've got Peter first hanging out with the most despised person that the Jews can think of, and now... Whether by his will or not, I'd have to read on. You've got a Roman authority get, sending two Roman soldiers to gather up this guy and bring him to a Gentile household. So Peter's on a downward slide as far as the Pharisees are concerned, probably. Uh, that's the thoughts that came after I, I spoke last time. Back to you. Um, all right. Um, I, I think that we ought to also... Uh, I'm sorry, Ted, were you ready to say something? Go ahead if you're ready. Yeah, I was going to say something. Unless you want to say something first, go ahead. Well, if you want, I'll go, go ahead of you. But uh, the um, I, I think I might have forgotten. Oh, yeah, I was talking about the, the, uh, the idea that it says he was a devout man, uh, along with his household, feared God. He made many charitable donations. I'm reading the Amplified now. He made many charitable donations to the Jewish people and prayed to God always. So here he is. I, I don't know how. Uh, I'd like to hear your explanations about what does that exactly mean. He feared God. He prayed to God. And he supported the Jewish uh, uh, people financially. Um, and yet he wasn't a Jew. He had. He was not a convert. Um, 
we, it's, it's accepted. All, it is, the reaction of the church is that he's a Gentile. How dare you? So everybody considers him a Gentile. So we know he was not a, a like the, some of these other people at Pentecost, maybe that converted to Judaism from you know all around the, the the known world. There, there were some converts. They're called proselytes. He wasn't a proselyte. Uh, so, but uh, in fact, in the I, I reference these charts that I've been looking at lately. Um, one of the charts, to me, makes a very interesting note in the chart. Let me see if I can find the right one real quick. Uh, it says, uh, oh, yeah, it says in, in Acts 10, this is about 40 AD, it says, Peter and the household of Cornelius, it says, the first full Gentiles receive Christ and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it phrases it, the first full Gentiles. And so that that uh, gets back to what we were talking about before, about the Samaritans, you know. They were not full Gentiles. They were they were believed in Judaism. They were a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. Now we're at the point where the first full Gentiles are coming into the church. But uh, I'm interested in your take on uh, this idea of him believing in God and being what do you say about that? Well, I didn't say it exactly earlier that, uh, you know, what I said was he was a he was a Gentile who uh, went with the light that God had given him. He certainly believed in the, in the God of creation, which was the Jews' God, the God uh, who, uh, who created the heaven and the earth. And I made the point when I was talking while you were gone that when uh, somebody, no matter who it is, uh, seeks God's light, uh, God gives them more light. I think that's a theme throughout all of Scripture. Even even uh, Romans chapter 2, Paul talks about even the Gentiles who know in their conscience, you know, that there's a God, that they do what's right in the eyes of God by conscience, you know, uh, the law of conscience, those type of things. Uh, this was a devout man. He just didn't go to synagogue. He, he hadn't technically converted the Judaism, the circumcision, the religious, religious ceremonies of washings and so forth. He didn't go to synagogue. He wasn't a convert, uh, a proselyte, which is you use the correct term there back from Acts 2. Uh, but certainly he was a, a devout man who believes in God. How many people do we know that that might be what we would call Christians nowadays who've never been to church, never taken uh, holy, you know, communion, uh, never been water baptized, things like that, but they're They've, they've put faith, even the size of a mustard seed, a faith in Christ, uh, and God says you're justified, you're mine. You know, I think uh, God obviously wouldn't have gone to the trouble of sending an angel to this guy if, if he didn't fit into the category of uh, of, a, of a believer, you know, in, in the true God at least. And uh, getting back to verse 43, I think our audience, listening audience, just, and I'm sure Joe would agree with this, uh, Simon the Tanner, when when Joe was talking about he dealt with a dead bodies, I I, I, we, I want to specify, and I hope Joe didn't mean this. This was bodies of, of animals, you know, uh, oxen, goats, and so forth. He was a tanner of those things. Uh, dealt, he was a leather worker, you know. So it was kind of a disgusting trade. What uh, when animals were slaughtered and they have to take off their hides and stuff, but just so little people. Hearing Joe, I think Joe said the word dealt with the dead bodies. When I hear dead bodies, I think of dead people. So <laughs> I'm sure he didn't mean that, but uh, back to you. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Uh, I'm not surprised that you already discussed that while I had to leave. So, um, Brother Joe, any more before I move on? Yeah, I was, I was just uh, reading uh, off of the meanings of names, you know, and they. And they they just uh, specified dead bodies. They didn't say uh, uh, just animal, but of course, that's right. You know, <clears throat> thinking back to you know when uh, Roy Rogers had his horse trigger stuff, and they asked his wife what she thought of it. She said, "Well, I'm glad the horse went first. Uh, nothing else to say." Oh, yeah, very good. I'm glad you inserted a little humor. Um, all right. Um, now, let me see, we're on verse, uh, 
Verse 7, I guess, yeah. And, and verse 7, And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and, and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And, and when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. Uh, on the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Uh, sixth hour, that would be about noon. They start to, at sunrise around 6 a.m. up to counting the hours. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they uh, made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel dis well, let me stop there before we go into the description of it. I don't want to cover too much ground at once, ending at verse 10. Uh, go ahead. I'm a little unclear. Uh, now, is he, is he still in Joppa? Uh, this is, is he on the rooftop of the Tanner uh, before Cornelius' guys get there? Yeah, and I, and I, I, and I, mis I misspoke when I said he sent two Roman soldiers. That was an assumption. He sent one Roman soldier and one of his household servants. So this guy had some uh, clout and uh, some uh, standing. Uh, I'm just curious as to whether all of this vision or trance he fell into was prior to going to uh, Cornelius's dwelling. Yeah, it's prior to. Uh, let me get, call in Ted then if you're if that's it. Or, or do you want to respond after? You, it, it, this is happening before Peter goes off to uh, to see Cornelius. Any, any more before we call on Ted? Yeah, I, I, I was always in the uh, understanding that this, this had happened after uh, he arrived at uh, Cornelius' place and he's getting ready for some uh, food. So uh, this is new to me. Back to you, back to Ted. All right, all right, Brother Ted. Yeah, if I'm understanding the chronology the, the, the right way, is after the vision, I mean, just read from the New King James. I think the King James says, on the morrow, New King James, the next day, as they went on their journey, this is the two servants and the Roman soldier to go uh, fetch Peter uh, at Joppa. So if I understand the chronology right, uh, the visions happened. Uh, he sends these guys to, to go get Peter like the angel said to do. And uh, that next day is when Peter goes on the rooftop of the house and I just think it's interesting how you read there, Brother Luke. He became very hungry. I mean, uh, quite frankly, there's there's been a, a couple of times. That I, I've always been a meat eater, but there's been a couple of my times in my life where uh, I just abstain from from meats and things like that after some things I've read online, you know, about uh, the way uh, meat is is you know, let's just say it goes from live cow to the store. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, it, it's interesting to me that, that Peter's with this tanner, which uh, you know, I'm sure he knew the process of what this involved, and he's around this guy, and certainly the guy didn't bring uncleanliness probably into his household, being a, being a Jew like Peter. Uh, probably would have gone through several washings and so forth to, to come back into his household, uh, or Peter wouldn't have been with him. But uh, I just think it's interesting that uh, I mean, was this guy not, not feeding him enough uh, fruits and vegetables or snacks between meals? Because <laughs> Peter goes up on the roof, and he becomes very hungry. And he would have eaten something if, you know, if he would have had something there. I just think that's funny. And then uh, while he's hungry, he has this trance. So uh, interesting. Back to you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm going to read it in the Amplified and then give you my thoughts on it. Um, um, let me see what verse we're on. Okay, um, verse nine. The, the next day, as they were on their way, so so um, uh, Cornelius had his vision. He sends the people to go get Peter, and uh, while they're on their way, it's the next day now. It says. And they were while they were approaching the city where Peter was, it says, Peter went up on the roof of the house about the sixth hour, noon, to pray. Uh, but be, he became hungry and wanted something to eat. Um, I don't mean, I don't think that means that he, uh, 
there was no food available. Uh, it's just that he just got real, got real hungry, and for some reason that's uh, put in here. I don't know the significance of it. Maybe it's the fact that uh, if people are fasting or if they, they, they haven't eaten, sometimes um, spiritual things are more likely to happen. That's why we're told, told to have a fast and pray. Uh, it says, while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Okay, so that's uh, that's up to, now we go to verse 11, but this trance is an interesting word, and it's trance also in the KJV and the Amplified. Um, so how do you define what a trance is? Um, all right, uh, I'm going to read now back to the KJV verse 11. And saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending upon him, uh, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Well, before we go on, ending of verse 16, let's get your thoughts on that part. Well, uh, a trance uh, certainly is differ differentiated here uh, in the in the Word of God from uh, other people who've had visions or had dreams. So uh, there's something uh, special about a trance, I suppose. I don't know what it is, but uh, it's something different. And so uh, I think fasting uh, is is something that uh, he may have been doing. To, to bring that on, uh, we're told, I, I had not fast, I, I'm not a faster, <laughs> to say the least. I remember uh, right before I got diabetes once, uh, this is years ago, I used to go into Dunkin' Donuts every single day, and uh, I always joked with the girls there, you know, I'm, I'm going on my way to dinner, but I want to stop and get the bird, uh, uh, dessert first in case I have my big heart attack uh, before I, I get done. And uh, once I, I went on a diet, and I walked in after a week or two, and <clears throat> the girls went, oh, Joe, we're so glad we are worried about you. We thought you had your heart attack. But, you know, something happens uh, special when you deprive yourself of, of food. I guess I spent too much time on that. But uh, the vision is incredible. And, and the first thing that, that pops to me is, here again, we have one of God's people questioning what the God Almighty of the universe is telling him. You know, uh, God didn't say it once. God didn't say it twice. Three times he had to say it uh, to uh, overcome Peter's objections to what God Almighty was telling him. His mind just couldn't wrap around this. And so, you know, we're talking uh, uh, um, someone who's very, very steeped in Jewish tradition here. Uh, as much as Paul probably, and so uh, kind of amazing. I, that's all that comes to mind. Back to you. Mm, all right, brother Ted. Well, this this to me is an amazing thing, and like you said, this is a big turning point. And uh, I like how Peter, uh, you know, doesn't say it's the Lord's voice, but we know that this is from God in verse thirteen. When he sees this vision of this great sheet, uh, and verse 12, even, all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, fowls of the air. I mean, my goodness, we can only imagine what all kind of wildlife was, was in this. And the voice that says to him, says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. You know, hey, you're hungry? Here you go. Eat. And it's just Peter, like Joe said there, automatically starts arguing with this authoritative voice from heaven and and gets uh, and uh, and pulls the righteous card out you know uh, I have never eaten anything 
unclean, anything that is common or unclean. Peter knew the law. Peter knew the Jewish law, the, the, uh, the Old Testament laws about dietary things. But the voice spoke again, said to him a second time, Listen, what God hath cleansed, uh, uh, that call not thou uh, common or unclean. It's like, listen, God's making a pronouncement, and don't argue with it. And uh, it was done three times, and, uh, and when, when it starts into verse 17, I know you're going to get into this, Peter doubted even after the vision was over. You know, he, he, he's asking himself, what, what can this really mean, you know? And then while he's thinking, we see who's going to show up. But this is, this is something really contrary to Peter's mindset. All, all his upbringing and all his adult years, you know, this, he's thinking, how can this even possibly be right? But, but he's going to find out. And he's going to find out what the analogy was all about. Back to you, brother. Hmm. You keep on saying things are going to happen. It sounds like maybe you've read this thing before, haven't you? <laughs> Uh, well, you said one thing that really like like amazed me that uh, you know so many times uh, something that should be very obvious, at least for me, I miss for years, for thirty years I miss it, and I didn't connect the idea that well why is he saying he's hungry, and then the vision's about food, <laughs> so. I never put those connected those together, and uh, you br you brought that to my attention. So that is very interesting. But uh, um, what this is this is this is history. <laughs> this is the end of Jewish dietary law, right here. Now Peter gets confused about this and compromises later on with Paul and the. Judaizers coming from Jerusalem, men from James, and all that later on. We'll get into that, but but this is where the Lord is declaring that this law is is over with. What what I'm I'm saying it's no longer unclean. It's no longer don't call it common, okay? And and the reason, of course, is because the Gentiles eat that way. And well, I want you to be with the Gentiles. You're going to become uh, joined with them. You're going to have fellowship with them. And so uh, it just means that you can't judge their food, and you can just eat the same thing as they do. Um, let me read it all in the in the Amplified here. Uh, it says, uh, at verse 11, And he saw the sky opened up, and an object like a great sheet. Like, like To me, a sheet would be something like a tablecloth, maybe. Descending... Uh, lowered by its four corners to the earth, and it contained all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. So these are things that are all forbidden in the Jewish dietary laws. A voice, a voice came to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not at all, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common, that is unholy and ceremonial unclean. And the voice came to him a second time, what God has cleansed and pronounced clean no longer consider common or unholy. That's really interesting how they phrase it there. Verse, let me see that in the Amplified. Uh, it says, what God has cleansed, that call not thou common. Uh, the Amplified phrases it no longer. And to me, this is the point that we need to get out of this. That this is the point where you're no longer under this dietary law. Now, this happened three times. And then immediately the object was taken up. Uh, Brother Joe emphasized that it was three times. but And that, that's an important point because this is Peter. I mean, the Lord has to tell him, uh, Peter, uh, thou lovest me? Of course I do, Lord. Then he asked him, Thou lovest me? Yes, of course I told you I love you. Do you, do you love me? Again. So he, he, he drives this point home three times with Peter on the beach. And, and, and then, and now three times in the vision. It seems like for some reason God wants to make a point to Peter and he does it three times. Maybe it's because he denied the Lord three times before the cock crowed. 
maybe this is a constant reminder to Peter about that failing he had. Um, all right, before I go on, any more thoughts? Just that that's, an, that's a, a very, very good thought. He did deny Christ three times. He, he was asked three times, uh, and here he's being uh, at the beginning of the Gentile uh, church uh, three times. I, there's got to be something to that. Thank you. Any more, Brother Ted? Yeah, well, once again, that's, I agree with Joe. That's, that's a good catch on your part. Good, good thoughts that uh, maybe three is, is Peter's number for, for him needing something drilled in his head. You know, the, uh, you know he denied the three Lord three times, but the Lord asked him, do you love me three times? Like you said, brother, he gets the vision three times just maybe to really drill it in. And uh, I would say, too, about this uh, the thing of us being no longer under the Levitical dietary laws, uh, just because, and, and I think Joe kind of alluded to this earlier about, about diet being important. I mean, just because something is allowable now, uh, you know, doesn't mean it's best <laughs> to eat. I mean, you know, uh, there's certain things uh, we wonder, we give thanks for before we eat them, and then we wonder why we have indigestion afterwards. Like Paul said in another place, uh, what was it? All things are permissible for me, but not all things are profitable. So, uh, back to you. Well, I, I need to comment on the way you phrased that that point that we are no longer under this Levitical dietary law. Uh, I always emphasize the point that we should never, ever think that Gentiles were ever under these laws. Um, so, the way you stated it, I, I just don't want people to get the impression that we we believe that that uh, okay. Gentile believers are somehow are under the Ten Commandments. Or the 613 laws, or the dietary laws. We, we never were. Yeah. We never. We, yeah, we never were under them. And now, whether some of these laws are, are beneficial, of course, the Ten Commandments. We know that it's beneficial. If you do, if you conduct yourself in that way, then you know, you know it's certainly you're going to have a better life than go out and murdering people and lying. And the consequences for that are going to be pretty, pretty bad. So there's a there's a reason for the laws, but they were never given. To the Gentile world, the Gentile world has always just been on the law, under the law of conscience. God wrote the law in our heart, so He just we we feel pricked in the heart, convicted of when we do things wrong. Um, let me read further. Um, verse 17, KJV. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house, and stood before the gate, and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing. For I have sent them, <laughs> Brother Joe. Yeah, that's a that's that brings a moment of clarity to his uh, to his doubt. I mean, he was so entrenched into Levitical law that uh, he was just having a hard time accepting this, as evidenced by the three times he had to be told. And uh, now uh, uh, he he's going to be walking into the belly of the beast here. Uh, there's a, a Roman soldier and, and uh, two house people uh, come to collect him. And uh, if God had not told him that uh, he, he was to go, uh, he may have had great fear. And he's certainly about to have a, a cultural uh, clash, to say the least. And I think somewhere in the Bible it says that to the apostle of somebody that uh, wherever you go, eat whatever is put before you. And so... Uh, that this continues, and I will add that uh, they never had to eat Mary's cooking. That may have been amended if Mary was back then. I'm not sure she's not looking. But anyway, that, that's all I have to say. All right, brother Chad. Wow, Joe. All right, 
I, I love that. I, it's one of those things, like you said, brother, you know, you read through a passage many times and you never see, but I love how verse 20, uh, you know, Peter gets the vision. Uh, the, the Spirit said to him after the vision, Three men seek thee. Uh, arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. I mean, it's like you were doubting. You certainly were, and you have been. I, I know your heart. I know the things that you're pondering there about the vision you just saw three times. And by the way, get down, get down there, and go with them, doubting nothing. I mean, uh, isn't it amazing how the Lord just you know reads us like a book, and but yet tells us you know go ahead and obey because I know what's best. Amen. Back to you. Hmm. Hmm. Well, Joe's mentioned a couple times how the uh, uh, he should be like afraid of these people. They're Romans, but um, I would think that Peter and the apostles at this point, if Caiaphas sent his men for them, they would be very you know, afraid because of the history of the persecution and the the, the 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 slaughtering of them by Saul. Even though they have a period now where it's the, the church is resting, but um, uh, the Romans haven't done anything persecuting uh, the new believers. Uh, apart from kill, after killing Jesus, the, the Romans haven't followed up at all. So I'm not so sure that he would be afraid because these people are sent from the Romans or Gen, but they, he could be repulsed and disgusted because, as I said numerous times, the, the the Jewish people did not want to associate. It was a very segregated, very uh, 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 you absolutely avoided having anything to do, and the last thing you want to do is eat a meal with a Gentile. So that might have been the, 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 the initial attitude if the Holy Spirit hadn't, or the Lord hadn't said to them, or an angel, I can't remember how it's phrased there, but said to them, go, three men are coming, go with them, don't have any more doubts about, about this. Okay, So that should put his mind at ease. And, um, let me read further. Oh, man, what verse am I on? I keep on losing my place. Okay, all right, verse 21. <clears throat> <clears throat> then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, <clears throat> Behold, I am he whom ye seek, which is the cause wherefore ye are come. No, I'm sorry, let me read that differently. Behold, I am he whom ye seek, what is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Okay, I think that's one, that one verse is enough to talk about there. Brother Joe? Yeah, I, I strongly disagree with that, what you said. Uh, I, when when they come to that front door, uh, I hear the word "bad boys." Song. Bad boys. What you gonna do? You know, the cops are there. Uh, and now the the Jewish people could not uh, kill their own without permission, I think. But centurions could. You know, they don't like the way you're looking at them. Uh, they could throw you into prison or slay you on the spot. And uh, so this is a, a Roman centurion, and uh, and they had nothing to do with them. I, I would be terrified, but uh, that's why they go into such detail to Peter. Listen, he's a good guy. Uh, the Jews like him. <laughs> no, you know, don't. I think they're saying don't be afraid. Uh, so uh, that's my only thoughts here. All right, brother Chad. Yeah, I think I agree with Joe. I think the way that uh, they introduce themselves and they introduce the the person of interest, you know, Cornelius. Uh, the, the first thing they say about him is, you know, after they say Cornelius the centurion, they say he's a just man. Uh, listen, Peter, just chill. Hear, hear what we're about to say. This, he's a centurion, but he's a just man. He's one that fears God, and 
he has a good reputation, a good report among all the nation of the Jews. And this guy's had a vision. And uh, he's been warned by God. He's been sent uh, in uh, by, uh, he sent us on behalf of the, the message from God. So um, to hear what you have to say, Peter, because so he's, he's saying, listen, Peter, whatever you have to come say to him, uh, uh, Cornelius is kind of at your mercy because he, he believes that you're going to be God's spokesman. There's something that you have to say to him, Peter, that he's told he needs to hear. So I think Peter gets at ease at this point, and, uh, and uh, you know, we can go on with that. But I think the first thing they do is uh, they, they set Peter at ease somewhat by telling him who he is, his reputation, and really why he wants to hear from Peter. So uh, back to you, brother. Okay. Let me see. Verse, verse 23. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow, after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and he had called together his kinsmen and near friends. Okay, let's stop there. Brother Joe? It's, I, I think it's important to note that, uh, uh, that this uh, centurion had a faith in God. Now, uh, I, I think you guys are in agreement. He probably was not a converted Jew. Uh, he didn't convert to Judaism yet. Maybe he did. I, I kind of think he did. Uh, he was with good report with the Jews and honored God. And so and I'm thinking maybe he was a, a, a Gentile that had converted to the, the uh, Judaism. But uh, he, only, he, can't, he had certain servants that he confided in. And he had one soldier that he told about what God had shown him. So I think there's a kind of an underground thing here. I don't think a centurion... Uh, would be wise to openly proclaim his uh, faith in God, no matter what it was, with uh, with the Caesar. You know, Caesar was God, and uh, in the Roman world, and to put any other god even with him doesn't even have to be better, just even, and and you're risking loss of job and life. So, I think there was kind of an underground faith of what sort I don't know, but a faith in God nonetheless that he shared with a, one of his men and a couple of his house servants. So this was kind of on the down low, and it's going to become out in the open when Peter gets there. Back to you. All right, Brother Ted. Yeah, well, there's, there's so much about that. Uh, you know, uh, the thing is, is uh, uh, the fact that uh, this guy wasn't a, a, a closet Disciple, you know, we today we'd say closet Christian. <laughs> the fact that uh, this guy, Cornelius, was so sure of his vision and so sure of the importance of it, and that he truly believed he was going to hear from one of God's spokesmen because he got a vision from the Lord God Himself uh, from an angel. He was so. This is this is like calling in uh, the cameras, you know. You know, he <laughs> calling in. Let's videotape this. Basically, let me get some witnesses. He called uh, in uh, his kinsmen, you know, which his 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 relatives, and he invited them in, and he invited his near friends, his neighbors, and so he goes. I, I want you guys in on this. And this guy was obviously a devout, devout man that didn't want to just keep it to himself. And uh, the fact that he called his his relatives and his near friends in, I think I think it's important because he's wanting to share what he believed was truly from God. He wasn't wasn't quiet about it, uh, probably discreet about it, about who he let know. Probably had to be some trustworthy people that knew of his faith. Uh, but I think I think that's important to note, uh, and uh, and we'll see what's happening here. Back to you, brother. Uh, well. Brother Joe, you have to give in and concede this uh, fact that he's not a convert because it's really, really important to the, to the, the event. If he's a convert, then there's nothing significant about him uh, becoming a believer because uh, he, he Jews converted to, to, uh, 
um, believing in Jesus. You know, it was common. Um, everybody who had been converted already was a Jew. The only thing that makes this historic is that he's not a Jew. And when, I'm not, and I'm talking about a, a convert, a proselyte. He hadn't. He had some kind of faith and knowledge about God, and he he believed in God and, and as best as he could. As we said, he had a certain amount of knowledge that was given to him. But uh, um, let me read this in the Amplified. Uh, Uh, the next day Peter got up and left with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went with him. <clears throat> On the following day, he and the others entered Caesarea. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter arrived, Cornelius met him and... Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, it's the next verse, and I think that will make the difference. But uh, the the... If he was a convert, as as you're supposing there, you know I don't know if you're stating it like you're, you're certain, but if you're if you think that he's possibly a convert, then um, it would not be anything eventful, uh, and, and certainly he'd also this issue of the diet would uh, not be an issue because Cornelius would be following Jewish dietary laws also, so. Uh, well, I'm going to read farther in the amp in the KJV again here. Let me see. Uh, okay, verse 25. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter stood him up and saying, "Stand up! I myself also am a man." And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. Uh, and, and he said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlawful thing for a, man, for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Um, and this is, in the Amplified, it will translate that as a Gentile. Um, but God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So it, it, he's, he's understanding this vision to be not just that the food issue, but even a Gentile, um, because as I said, they, they consider the Gentiles unclean. They wouldn't associate with them. Uh, I guess I'll stop at verse 28. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I, I definitely I definitely uh, can see uh, as soon as you mentioned the dietary restrictions, uh, I, I understood immediately, yeah, he could not have been a, a converted Gentile to the Jewish religion simply because of a, he would have to follow the Levitical law, and, uh, and he certainly did not. So that rules out the possibility that he was a, a Gentile converted to Judaism. Uh, I, I happily concede that. And what strikes me even more uh, is what you just read out of the uh, Amplified. That that uh, scroll or that trance that Peter had, was a, had to do... Uh, not just with dietary restrictions or food, like I'd always thought, but the Gentiles themselves. Uh, they're not unclean either. And I, I missed that point. I, I was thinking this was all about food. It's not. It's about the Gentiles. Back to you. Um, that portion I just read was the KJV. So it even says that clearly in the KJV. But uh, I'll read it. When I, it's my turn, I'll read it in the uh, Amplified, see how it states it. Uh, Brother Ted? Yeah, well, um, good stuff there, guys. Absolutely. And the things that, that jump out at me is uh, verse 25, right, right when Peter comes in, the fact that Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Now, we know what Peter's response is. Peter took him up. <laughs> Peter literally, it sounds like from the text there, Peter literally hey, like, looked him up and said, hey, you know, get, get up here. He says, I myself also am a man, you know. Get up! Don't don't do this. We see this happen in another couple of places in Acts with I think Paul and Barnabas. Uh, you know, but the thing that we can contrast this contrast this with is the fact that you know Jesus never refused worship. You know, we see a few times in the Gospels and, and in Revelation where, where Jesus receives worship, 
and never never rejects it. This is this is one of the affirmations uh, of the deity of Christ and the mere mortality and the mere humanness of, of Peter and his apostles. You know, you've got some religions today that would, if Peter showed up today, they'd worship Peter. You know, they'd fall down at his feet and worship him. They worship statues of him, for goodness' sake, or at the mere uh, image of Peter. Uh, but Jesus never re refused worship. True deity, true God in the flesh. Uh, uh, Thomas, John uh, 20, 28, uh, said unto him, My Lord and my God. And, and Jesus didn't say, Oh, no, no, get up, Thomas. Don't, don't do that. Don't, don't fall down and worship me. No, Jesus all the times in the Gospels received worship. Peter, on the other hand, did the right thing and says, Listen, I'm just a man. You know, in today's... Uh, wording, we'd say, listen, I put my, my pants on one leg at a time, brother, just get up, get up, and just let's talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, let's, let's put our focus where it needs to be. So that that's what jumps out at me. And then, and you said, brother Luke, by the time uh, the, verse 28 there ends, we know Peter's got the vision down. He understands now the meaning of the vision, and no hesitation, he says, but God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean, that the real emphasis there is on other people groups uh, other than the Jews and, and people who are converted to Judaism. He says, the real issue that God showed me is that I should not call any man common or unclean, and that's why I'm here to talk to you. Uh, back to you, brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to look at it in the Amplified, but I, that last point cannot be overstated, that uh, it's not just a question of the, the dietary laws being saying or that no longer applies, but no longer can you be prejudiced against these Gentiles. You cannot discriminate, no more segregation, no more hatred of these people. Don't consider them to be unclean people. Now, that is equally important, and even more important than the dietary laws. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, the thing about this that is, uh, this is revolutionary. What's happening right here is one of the most important points of the entire Bible. If I had to pick just a handful of key points in the Bible, this would be one of them. Because uh, when, when we get to the reaction of the Jerusalem church, James especially, to Peter, you, then you're going to really understand how, how revolutionary this was when you see how they react to Peter daring to even associate with the Gentile, eating with the Gentile, and you told them about Jesus? What's wrong with you? So, um, yeah, this is uh, the first Gentile conversion. This is like up there top, near the top of the list of big things. Uh, let me put it that way. I can see. Okay. All right. So now uh, let me read that left portion in the Amplified. Um, okay, when Peter arrived, arrived, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up, I too am only a man. As Peter talked with him, he entered the house and found a large group of people assembled. He said to them, You know that it is unlawful for a Jewish man to associate with or befriend a Gentile or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I am not to call anyone common or ceremonially unclean. Um, verse, I, I think I'll, therefore I went, uh, therefore when I was sent for you, I came without raising any objections. So I asked, for what reason have you sent me? Okay, I'll, I'm going to, we'll end it there because uh, uh, I can't, I don't know about you guys, but I cannot believe that, we're near the end of the study today. This is another example. We had one the other day that I just was shocked at how it zoomed by. But uh, it's just been so uh, interesting, so much fun. Just time flew by. Um, so I guess we need to sum up uh, our thoughts uh, on the study today, and then I'll give a gospel message. Uh, Brother Joe? Yeah, in, in summary, I, I, there's so much that can be said here. But what amazes me the most is uh, my sidebar comment there. I think if you stopped 100 Christians at the mall, and there's only Christians there, and said, what was the deal with the, uh, the trance that Peter had on the, court, on the roof regarding Gentiles? 
I bet 99 out of 100 would say, oh, well, that was God revealing we can eat any food we want. I mean, that's what everybody thinks. That was such the minor point. It was talking about men. And uh, I, you know, I guess I'm part of that 99% until now. Uh, I, I did not realize the emphasis was not food at all. But, but uh, we, pe we, the Gentiles, and, and to me, that's the most amazing thing uh, of the study today. And uh, I, I guess that's my summary, because that's all my mind is stuck on. Back to you. Well, now you're, now you're in the top 1%, brother. <laughs> brother Ted? Well, I didn't know Joe was a one percenter, but I guess we'll forgive him that. It's okay. Uh, I, I, it can't be emphasized enough. I mean, we had a lot today, didn't we, guys? I mean, all the way from uh, Tabitha being uh, raised from the dead uh, to this, uh, uh, let's call him a religious centurion, a devout man, uh, being rewarded for his, uh, his seeking of God. Uh, they that come to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder. And, and uh, Cornelius is evident. He is, God is a rewarder of people like Cornelius that diligently seek him. I don't think we should take any kind of passive approach, guys, to our, to our Christianity, uh, regardless of what you know dispensation people are in. I think that, that verse rings true. God hears the prayers of those who diligently seek him, seek his will. And uh, look what happened for this guy. Um, Peter comes in, makes one of the greatest revelations uh, known, certainly to us as the nations, and it doesn't matter how much Jewish blood I have in my veins, uh, where God's saying we're all included. You know, the, the revelation is going to come that that God is reconciling everybody. Everybody's included on this plan of salvation. And the way we ended our study today was great, right there, Luke, where you finished. God has showed me. Peter says, God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Nobody is unredeemable. <laughs> The only person that's unredeemable is the person who breathes their last breath, not wanting to be redeemed. So that's that's my summary. That's what I got out of this today. It's a good study, brother. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So we went from uh, chapter nine, verse twenty-five, to chapter ten, verse thirty. We covered a lot of ground, actually, uh, because a lot of the times a point. It took four or five verses to, to they had to all be connected to be discussed and so uh, that's why we were able to cover a lot of verses even though there were some profound um, truths that we, we uh, really established and, and to, to me I, I, you know, I am this to me is one of the most important parts of the whole scripture for so many reasons but also because of the the false teaching that uh, the Gentiles, the message for the Gentiles is only from Paul. And, and I, I've just been so struggling against that for years now, and it's, it's just disappointing to me that um, it's, thankfully it's a small faction. The, the hyper-dispensationalists, uh, I don't think it's more than 10% of Christian people who identify themselves as Christians, maybe it's five percent. These they are the right dividers, but it's it's ironic that they identify themselves as the right dividers, but they're the ones that are the over dividers. They're getting rid of everything except for what Paul wrote. But what really angers me about it is that they they actually diminish Jesus, Peter, and John. And, and they're, they're not nearly as important. You can get by without them, as long as you've got Paul. So um, this study today shows us that Peter was the first apostle to the Gentiles. The first time Gentiles got saved, it was from Peter's message. God chose Peter to be the first to give the message to, to the Gentiles, Cornelius and his family. And uh, the next study, of course, when he gives them the gospel, uh, you're going to... We're going to also see when he argues with James later on that the term believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that we so commonly associate with Paul in Acts 16.31, that that same phrase is used by Peter when he explaining uh, the, the Cornelius and he's explaining it to James. So uh, 
he was the first to say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the first to say to the, the Gentiles are the uh, same as us, they're just as acceptable as us. And uh, that's what I uh, think is really important from all this. Um, now, the gospel message will end here with just a couple of minutes left to cover that. The, uh, the gospel is a um, Greek word. It means good news. And the, the good news is, 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 as briefly as I can state it, is that um, if you want to go to heaven, it's offered to you as a free gift from Jesus. That's the most succinctly I can, I can put it. Heaven is a free gift. Just receive it from Jesus. That's the only way. Put your faith in Jesus, you get the gift of eternal life in heaven. Uh, the, the, the reason this is uh, it's so important to understand is because that you, you, cannot, um, you cannot put your faith in any other way uh, as a means of salvation. Because Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus either was lying and was uh, just absolutely conceited thing saying that you can't get to heaven without me, or it's the truth. And you need to accept the truth, that put faith in Jesus is the only way. You, putting your faith in any religion of the world is not the way. Uh, putting your faith in your ability to follow all the tenets of a religion, that's not the way. Putting your faith in your ability to uh, turn over a new leaf in your life and clean yourself up and make yourself acceptable to God, that's not the way. So if you're trying to get to heaven some other way, then it's doomed to failure. This is what the Bible tells us. And this, sadly, you don't, you're not going to hear this at most churches in America or around the world. You're not going to hear it on, on televangelisms. You're not going to hear it on Christian radio for the most part. They're going to tell you that, yeah, you need to believe in Jesus, but you've also got to repent of your sins and change your life. And they have a, a formula, Jesus plus your own personal merit will make you acceptable to God and you've got to reject everything apart from faith in Jesus put your faith completely in Jesus and nothing else and that's when you get the gift because because when you say you believe Jesus is your Savior it means that he's your Savior not anything else it's really that's that simple and once you put your faith in Jesus the Bible says in an instant the Holy Spirit of God baptizes you, indwells you, seals himself in you, and he'll never leave you. You become a child of God, uh, and you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven, and it's irreversible and irrevocable by you or by God. God says that he promises you're going to go to heaven, and it says God cannot break a promise or a lie. So if you put your faith in Jesus now, you can rest assured. That's why we call it the blessed assurance of salvation. You can be confident and assured you're going to go to heaven. And it's not because of one good thing you've done in your life. It's because of the one good thing Jesus did for you. He died and paid for all your sins. And he raised himself back to life as a sign to prove he is God, he is the Savior, and he, he does have power over life and death. And he promises to raise you to life everlasting uh, if you put your faith in him. I hope you do it today. Uh, brothers, uh, in, in, any last words before we close? Just a just good study, Luke. Good study. Okay. Thanks again for um, Brother Ted, what were you saying? No, thank you, brother. Good study. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, uh, everybody, th uh, thanks for participating again. And viewers, uh, uh, thank you for watching. And bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.